have that privilege, but if I have to give it to you, it's no problem. Okay. Welcome to the 43rd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. These calls are held every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. My name is Scott Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we have a researchers roundtable in which we're going to be discussing pandemics and history. And our guest today is Monica Green, Monica H. Green and Jacob Steer Williams. We are streaming on YouTube live. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter. And uh, my Twitter handle is at US of Disaster. You can also hear the COVID calls recorded as podcasts. Just go to soundcloud.com and connect with the COVID calls podcast. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and topics. On Thursday, we have a discussion about COVID-19 in Texas and environmental justice with reporters Caitlin Bain and Jacob Dick from the Beaumont Enterprise newspaper and John Beard, the founder uh, and director of the Port Arthur Community Action Network. As of today, there are 4,292,139 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 4,233,504 cases yesterday. 1,385,639 of those are in the United States, up from 1,358,000 yesterday. There are now a total of 83,648 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States, up from 81,805 reported yesterday. As a way to bring some humanity to those numbers, I've been reading a life story every day and I'd like to continue that now the headline is family of Odessa man who died from COVID-19 shares their story. This comes from CBS 7 in Odessa, Texas, April 9th. They say you never really know what it's like until it happens to you. An Odessa family is living that reality after they became the first to lose a family member to coronavirus in Ector County, Texas. COVID-19 killed Angela Madrazo's uncle Mario Arroyo. The 69 year old died Monday at Odessa, uh, Monday, this is in, in April, around April 9th. The 69 year old died Monday at Odessa Regional Medical Center after spending almost two weeks in the hospital by himself. It's been so hard because his kids or his wife or his siblings weren't able to go see him at the hospital, said Madrazo. According to the Ector County Health Department, Arroyo was the second person to test positive for the virus in the county. Since then, the entire family has quarantined themselves. Madrazo says for three weeks, they were not able to grieve together, to eat together, even to hug each other. And that's a reality she never thought she would live to see. So you go through Netflix, you go through Facebook, you go through Instagram, Twitter, and then you get tired of seeing the news, even on social media. And then you're like, whoa, this is real. And then you start thinking about what the news people would say. You're not going to see your family member. You're not going to be allowed to be in there. You're not going to be allowed to touch him. And if they pass, you're not going to be able to say your goodbyes. You're not going to be able to do none of that. You used to think, yeah, right. And now it's like, it's true. Angela Madrazo told the uh, CBS 7 that her uncle Mario was a welder all of his life, as well as a musician. Tragically, his father also died in early March. There is a GoFundMe page for the family uh, that had been started to help the family pay for funeral expenses family of Odessa man who died from COVID-19 shares their story. CBS 7, Odessa, Texas, April 9th. <clears throat> well, I'd like to introduce my guests today. Monica H. Green is an independent scholar and an elected fellow of the Medieval Academy of America. Her work has won book prizes and teaching awards from both the Medieval Academy of America and the History of Science Society. Currently, she is working in two different areas. On the one hand, she continues her work on the intellectual and social history of European medicine in the 11th and 12th centuries. 
looking at the impact of Arabic medicine on Latin Europe. On the other hand, she's continuing her work on the global histories of the world's leading infectious diseases with a particular focus on plague and leprosy. She's bringing out a new edition of her edited volume, Pandemic Disease in the Medieval World, Rethinking the Black Death. And her book, The Black Death, A Global History, is in progress. My second guest is Jacob Steer Williams. Jacob is an associate professor of history at the College of Charleston and an editor of the Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences. His work centers on the history of public health and the history of disease in the 19th and 20th centuries, particularly in Britain and the British Empire. He is the author of the forthcoming uh, in November of this year, The Filth Disease, Typhoid Fever and the Practices of Epidemiology in Victorian England with the University of Rochester Press. His current book project examines networks and practices of public health in colonial India and South Africa during the third plague pandemic of the late 19th and early 20th century. During the current COVID-19 pandemic, his work has been featured on several public forums, including the Post and Courier, CNN, and live webinars for the American Association for the History of Medicine, Princeton, and the Royal College of Physicians, and now COVID Calls. So I would like to welcome Monica and Jacob. Thank you for making time to join me on COVID Calls today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here, Scott. So I'd like to remind people that you can get your questions in um, any way that's convenient for you. You can put them into the chat in YouTube Live, or you can email me directly. Some people do that. My email is sgk23 at drexel.edu, or you can just put them up on Twitter and be sure to tag me at US of Disasters. So um, Monica and Jacob, I've been starting these calls by asking people um, where they are and how things are right now, where they are. So Monica, could I start? with you with that first question. How are things where you are? Certainly I'm in Phoenix, Arizona um, and it's actually cooled down um, the last few days. We were um, into the hundreds last week. Um, uh, things are interesting. Um, uh, I and um, my daughter have been um, uh, mostly staying in our house. So we don't have a, a, a sense of of what's going on other than um, uh, what gets on the news. Uh, but we had an interesting experience last week of going out um, to one of our uh, regular takeout places. And it was a zoo um, there. It was, it was, it was, um, anyway, we, it, it, we ended up not getting our food because basically there was um, just kind of dysfunction taking over. Um, uh, the place, it seemed to be only very young people who were actually uh, on staff there. Um, there was no visible supervision. Um, uh, and anyway, it was, it, was, it was a minor thing, but it was, it was actually very, very stressful um, just to see um, that kind of social meltdown um, just so close to our home. Is that the first time that you had tried to go to the restaurant since uh, the sheltering began or it's an old uh, no, experience? No, we had, we had, um, we've been trying to, to at least once a week um, um, make an investment in, in the local restaurants. You know, for those that are staying open, uh, we want to do our part to, to help support them. So it wasn't the first time, but it was the first time that we had had that experience of just kind of seeing the buildup over, over a number of weeks of um, what I assume are staffing problems, supply problems, um, and increasingly um, dis disgruntled patrons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this has come up in a number of different ways with people I've talked to in the last couple of weeks, more people out on the street, more people exercising, more people um, in restaurants and uh, quickly exceeding the kinds of recommendations that are, that are out there. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's leading to, in some cases, I, I guess still continuation of helping behaviors and pro-social behaviors, but in other cases, exactly what you've described, a couple of other people have told me similar, similar mm -hmm. stories to that. Yeah. Jake, Jacob, could I um, ask you the same question? I yeah, assume you're so, in Charleston, how are things? Charleston, so yeah, I've been trying to think about this uh, a lot lately and it, and it seems like, you know, at least in Charleston and in South Carolina, more broadly in the state, we're in this kind of fascinating public health epistemological problem um, that I think a lot of people in a lot of cities are, which is we just don't know. So, you know, cases in Charleston uh, that are official cases are lower than a lot of other places. 
but uh, the state statistics say that as of this morning, we've only tested 1.64 percentage of the population in the state. So we just don't know, um, frankly. Um, and I think, you know, to echo Monica's comment, I've definitely seen the same thing here in Charleston, you know, I've kind of likened it to a kind of epidemic, a pandemic fatigue or a, a quarantine fatigue where, you know, I think I've, you know, in think about the last six or eight weeks, seeing more people out um, in, in public spaces. So mm -hmm. I had uh, Joan Donovan on last week and, and she said that it, it, this had felt to her for the first several weeks like a snow day and now it feels like a sick day. And that mm -hmm. seems to be resonating with with people. This that something, some sort of inflection point has been reached about the psychology of the sheltering, and maybe we're beginning to see, beginning yeah. to see that. Jacob, I want to um, bring the first question to you, and um, I just want to. You have a piece up on CNN.com with Jennifer Lazat, and uh, the headline is "Trump's outrageous suggestion comes with a dark history." The news cycle moves so quickly, so people may be forgetting. But let's remind them. Uh, in the piece you write about uh, the president's idea, he claims later, he claimed later, it was sarcasm of using household disinfectants to combat COVID-19, perhaps even for personal ingestion. And you say in the piece, it's critical for everyone to heed the message about how dangerous this suggestion is, but it's also important to realize that this is not the first time that disinfectants appeared at the center of a health crisis or as part of a politicized resistance to sound medical advice. There is a longer history here that can help to frame the latest disbelief and bewilderment at the president's remarks. I found your piece really enlightening. I wonder if you could sketch out for us, what is this longer history that you're, you're referring to and how does it connect with your broader research? Great, yeah, thanks Scott. So the modern uh, history in the last couple of hundred years of using disinfectants to solve the threat of infectious disease is both, I think, a really interesting, provocative and, and troubling story. So it's well known in the history of medicine, for example, and, and somewhat in the broader public that in the 1860s, the Scottish surgeon Joseph Lister develops this elaborate scheme um, of antisepsis and asepsis using carbolic acid of soaking dressings in carbolic acid, spraying operating rooms in patients. And it's seen as a kind of innovative use of a new kind of chemical um, phenol, which is derived from the coal tar production, was you know really started manufacturing in the 1830s and the 1840s. Um, but it, it, it's sort of well known that that Lister only considered this because uh, the municipal authorities in Glasgow were, were dunking and putting carbolic acid in the sewers to prevent the bad smells. So carbolic acid starts its life out tied to miasma theory, um, and then it has this history in surgery that that folks know about. But what people don't really know a lot about and what my second book project is all about is how disinfectants were used by public health authorities in the late 19th and the early 20th century. And there was almost this sort of salvation aspect towards using carbolic acid in this period. Um, and my foray into the history of disinfectants came from an archival discovery, not unlike how a lot of historical projects start. And I just wanna share um, if, if this will work um, this archival photograph. Did that work? Uh, we, we're not seeing it no. yet. You are the host. There we go. Looks like we are, there we are. Yep. Okay, so this photograph here. Um, I, th I found this at the Welcome Archives in London. Um, and folks that know that space, it's one of the, the biggest collections of the history of, documenting the history of uh, medicine. And this was in uh, an RAMC uh, file, officer's files, Royal Army Medical Corps, uh, this, this, you know, health officer who had been in India and in South Africa. And, you know, when I stumbled upon this photograph, I instantly knew that I'd found something that was important. Um, what this depicts is the only extant photograph that I'm aware of. Um, and after a couple of years of research, I, I haven't found any more photographs of this process, although a lot of documentation of health official, British health, colonial health officials uh, in the process of, of dipping in vats of crude carbolic acid, indigenous uh, Indians in, the, in, in Karachi. Um, and the, the reports that followed both this document and, and many others that I found throughout late 19th century India and South Africa show that this was a routine practice um, of doing this. And, and what's so interesting about, um, about 
uh, the use of carbolic acid by this period during the third plague pandemic is that it was well known by colonial authorities that carbolic acid both was harmful to the skin, right? Um, that it burned the skin and its dangerous effects more broadly speaking. Um, so in, in, in surgery and surgical practice, there were already safer alternatives by the 1890s. Um, you know, if you look at chemistry textbooks, it's well known that carbolic acid is a dangerous crude substance, yet it's being used and wielded wholeheartedly by colonial officials, you mm. know, in India and South Africa in this moment of crisis. Um, so I'm really just sort of interested in how this technology gets used despite the warnings of its safety. Um, mm in favor of what was seen as efficacious destruction of microorganisms, which laboratory studies in the 1880s and 1890s had shown, yet it was differentially used on black and brown bodies in that period to sort of further advance colonial objectives. And what you're describing, carbolic acid then would not have been appropriate to use on citizens in, in the UK, but it's okay to use it in the empire. Is that, I mean, is that it's very yeah, simplified? That's right. so what's yeah, that's right. So what's interesting is carbolic acid and, and some of the other um, alternatives are used, but they're not used on, on bodies. So they're used to s spray the homes of working class people all throughout the UK and in, in North America. I mean, by uh, 1901, Rhode Island's health officer he, he writes this, uh, this article and he, he calls it the fetish of disinfection. So disinfection had become so, so widely used by the turn of the century that people are already starting to you know, warn against its use you know, in all practices. But it's sort of used in, in urban spaces in Europe and North America on dwellings and on clothing. But then in colonial locations, it's used on the bodies of indigenous peoples. So that, that disjunct is, is really fascinating to me. I mean, I'm always hesitant to ask people to climb inside the mind of the president of the United States, but, but for maybe just for a second here, when you saw him mention that, um, what, what did you think? I mean, it did seem to resonate. I mean, well, probably, hopefully with a very small segment of the population. And yet there is this chord across time that was, that was struck. What is he referring to? What did he have in mind? Yeah, so I mean, if you if you go back and and watch um, that press conference really closely, uh, what had the remarks that had been given before uh, President Trump made made this uh, this now pretty infamous um, line about ingesting disinfectants is um, one of his undersecretaries talking about research that was happening, scientific research that was happening as to the the the, the destroying what kind of things destroy. The, this, this novel coronavirus. And they talked about sunlight and they talked about the use of bleach and isopropyl alcohol. Um, and, and, and there's you know, lots of studies that are coming out now um, as to how long of exposure, um, both sunlight and, and you know, disinfectants, to that, that how long will it take to kill um, this virus? And um, so you know, what's interesting to me is how quickly he slipped into ingestion when that wasn't previously discussed at all. Um, and, and, you know, there is this broader history here that I think um, makes such a suggestion, even if we want to go with what he said afterwards, which was it was a slippage, it was a joke, even if we want to accept that as reality, I think this longer history, you know, for myself as a historian and somebody interested in this, in the differential use of disinfectants yeah. across race and class, was this big red flag to me that even if you were joking, in a moment of a crisis is not a time to joke about such a thing. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for telling us the, the story behind the story of that great piece, that CNN.com piece. Monica, let me uh, come to you. So many questions for you. I want to start with this one, um, actually, that, and I'm sure you have both been asked this a lot in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, people are asking, well, what is there in the storehouse of history that you have for us? What cases have you got for us? The 1918 influenza has been cited regularly, people searching that for useful lessons maybe. But the Black Death, um, the plague of the 14th century has been invoked as well. And I, I wanna ask you, why do you think that the Black Death is such a consistently compelling episode in history? Have you been surprised that it's come up even in this moment? No, I haven't been surprised at all. Um, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, um, the Wikipedia entries, and there are Wikipedia entries on the Black Death in almost every language. 
I actually um, checked with a Wiki, uh, Wikipedian um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and there's 107 different um, uh, entries for the Black Death in, in various languages. Um, the English language alone um, gets about uh, 4 million, I'm sorry, 40 million hits um, a, a year. Um, so that's in normal times. I don't even know what the, um, uh, the statistics are now. The, the Black Death is um, stamped in Western cultural memory. Um, to varying degrees, it's also stamped in, in the memory of, of other cultures um, as, as well. And I think that the simple reason is it was the biggest. Um, uh, when we're talking minimum 30% mortality overall. Um, uh, studies that have been done, and, and the, the thing about it, really when, when you're dealing with any pre-modern period, and even when you're dealing with a modern period as, as we've seen with the, the, the issue of counting deaths from, from COVID-19, it is actually really hard um, to, uh, to come up with, uh, with good numbers. So anything that we talk about um, before, uh, before certainly 1800, is more or less a guess and more or less uh, specific to the, the city um, or the region where we're getting that, that data. Um, but every time a new study comes out, it's actually increasing the percentage of mortality. And this is not case fatality rates, it's overall population loss. So when we're getting estimates uh, looking at 50% uh, mortality or even 60%, um, mortality from very closely detailed records. Um, that's shocking. That's shocking. And, and literally we cannot imagine, you know, as, as much tra trauma collectively as the world is going through right now, we cannot imagine mortality on that level. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that uh, created at the time um, certain kinds of, of memories. And I think this is just uh, as important as history has dredged up various kinds of memories. Um, and so what you see in a lot of popular literature, um, videos um, and so forth, is a lot of collapsing of history. So very, the very famous plague doctor um, that is, it's, 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 it's a meme unto itself now of the, the, the mask that looks like a beak and the, and the, the hat and the big overcloak. Um, that's 17th century. That's from the 17th century. It cannot be documented in, in use any earlier than the 17th century, but everybody thinks Black Death and that, that image immediately comes up in their mind. So that's, that's the big thing is that the Black Death is a big black box really in which we put a lot of terror. Hmm. And I think that hmm. that's how it functions. Um, in, in a lot of popular, popular culture. The other thing that you'll find is mm. at least everything that I've looked at, and I can't claim to have looked at everything, but everything I've seen in popular media from uh, New York Times on down is not engaging with the latest research. They don't care about the latest research mm. um, about the Black Death. They keep going back to the stories mm -hmm. um, that they've heard, that they've been told, that they've um, in, inherited. And that's what I find surprising mm. is not that um, so many people kind of go to the Black Death for some kind of comparative analysis, but they don't go with it with any curiosity mm. um, to say, well, actually, maybe we know something now that we didn't know 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's actually really interesting. The Black Death functions in a lot of ways that are metaphorical hmm. rather than really historical. I, it's so fascinating to me, that, to me the way you, you put that. I spoke last week with uh, Chuck Strozier uh, and Chuck has written a lot about apocalyptic thinking and terrorism mm -hmm. and we talked about the nuclear. And he talked about the nuclear is exactly the way you talked about. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a much more recent threat, but he yeah. drew that same, it's, it's sort of a black box in which all other fears are put. Yeah. And on the one hand, of course, that's a valuable cultural insight because it means we need places to put those fears. Yeah. Yeah. But it also does some damage or it, it can gum us up in our historical enterprises because 
people allow sort of, well, it was an era of fear and everybody was under a desk and they don't get into the much grainier, yeah. like what exactly the decisions were made. Uh -huh. um, and that history and, is much more at happen? our fingertips. Yeah, exactly. Did it, it didn't happen? come from nowhere. Right. How, how did it happen? And how did, how did some part of society live through it? Right. Um, I, I, I think we should be very careful. And I just did it now. I used we, um, we historians, um, anybody who's talking in a historical mode should be very careful about how we're using we, um, because um, there there are a lot of peoples, a lot of cultures that don't survive these events. Let me ask a sort of stay with this line of thinking because you both look at diseases in what most people would consider the distant past, um, sometimes the very distant distant past. The cases that you look at scientists and physicians today know a lot more about the disease than the people of the time did, the people mm -hmm. in which you're looking. So how does that simple but impor important fact shape the way that you approach your work? I wanna ask both of you that. Maybe Monica, could you take that on first and then Jacob come to you? Certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, I have been, uh, first of all, in I was aware of the, uh, 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 the COVID-19 outbreak by Certainly, the middle of January might have uh, been uh, earlier than that, um, and I think I made—I I actually checked to see when did I make a um, a folder for it on my computer to say, okay, this is something where I need to be collecting um, things. And I think it was something around the, the third week of January. Um, what I have been amazed at, and and this is precisely because of the research that I've been doing on plague. Um, and, and these other diseases is this is, and, and uh, Tedros, the um, uh, director of uh, the WHO said this as well. This is the first pandemic where we actually have the science moving as fast as the virus. Mm. Um, the, the first genome of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 was sequenced by January 5th. It was published by January 11th. And that's just been mounting um, ever since. So we have never, at least since um, January, been in any doubt about what was causing it, about, uh, there's still obviously debates about the, the mechanisms of spread. And this is why we're still talking about disinfectants and um, social distancing and so forth. Um, but the science is, has been on board from day one. Um, and, and that has not been true of any other disease. So think about even the 1918 flu pandemic. They didn't, um, they knew what, vi they had a concept of viruses at the time, but viruses were not actually identified. There was no um, uh, mechanism, scientific mechanism to see viruses mm. until about 20 years later um, in the 1930s. Um, so they had an idea of this, uh, this is probably a, a virus because we can't identify any bacterial cause for it. Um, but you know, to that, that extent, they were still working in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so most of the, the, the interventions that were being made were um, pulling, pulling out interventions that had been developed for other diseases mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, in, in various kinds of ways. Um, so that's, that's um, really just the, the, the very big thing. So black death, cholera, yellow fever, you can name all of them, that those societies were in, in the same state of ignorance as people were in the 14th century. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the way we understand, you know, ignorance and, um, mm -hmm. and knowledge of, of having that, that kind of scientific understanding. Um, I think we're in a completely different place um, right now. Um, there are other things <laughs> sure. that, that, that are very different, um, uh, but, but that's, that's the, the discontinuity that I see between um, where we are now and where anybody else has been um, prior to the second half of the 20th century. Another fascinating insight. I mean, this inflection point that future historians going ahead will be looking at this time, and as you say, at a moment where the scientific understanding is, is, is there at the moment in which the infection is spreading. And then, uh, Jacob, I want to ask that same question of, of you as a historian. Um, particularly when we look at disasters, you know, we know things that they didn't know at the time. And so that affects the way we think about the narrative, the sources we go looking for. How does, how does this play out in your work? 
Yeah. Um, well, one, I think like Monica's, uh, you know, comments there are, are super interesting and that discontinuity, I think is really important in understanding this moment. And, you know, just to sort of, you know, plug Monica, I think Monica is the leading historian of, of disease and medicine who, who deals with, you know, at the same time, the historical kind of archive and work. All, and, and in addition to that, to, to, you know, the best science, you know, she mentioned the genetic sequencing um, on diseases and you know she she's our go-to person in the field for that so thank you Monica um, but maybe I could take this from a slightly different angle which is seeing some continuity um, mm -hmm. so in the period that I that I specialize in in the late 19th early 20th century um, people that know that era will be familiar with you know the the early period of the germ theory and at least for diseases that are caused by bacteria for the discovery of of you know, in the laboratory of those diseases. And what's so interesting to me is in this period of the late 19th, early 20th century, and I kind of approach this from the cultural history of science and medicine. And in my typhoid book um, that's coming out, what I find so fascinating is the way that this new kind of expert that emerges, um, the epidemiologist, someone that works in local governments, state governments, mm -hmm. you know, their whole position is just to track epidemics when they when they spring up and find their origin and, and discover how they spread in the population to map, produce maps, to produce statistics, to make arguments about how diseases are spreading and how they can be prevented. Um, all of that was happening in this period in a way in which that knowledge was part of everyday practices. So going to, you know, all across, you know, in my work in Britain um, or in the British empire, you know, traveling, um, talking to people, working on those statistics, creating those maps and those visuals. And that kind of scientific information, what I'm so interested in is how it had to be communicated to mm -hmm. different audiences. So it had to be communicated for it to work. Mm -hmm. It had to be communicated to local politicians, to you know, state and federal politicians. It had to be you know, talked through with everyday people, to builders, to engineers, um, to you know, dairy farmers. And, and I liken that in my book to a set of performances that, that this new kind of health science scientist uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century had to perform a kind of expertise, but to different audiences. And, and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and what I think, you know, how that relates to today, um, and anybody that uh, watched the, the Senate hearings of Fauci, you mm -hmm. know, is when he was dealing with Rand Paul, which is, you know, in the headlines today, um, but basically calling it, calling Fauci out is, you know, you're not the only expert here. And, you know, I think his answer is really indicative of this longer arc of how public health officials, epidemiologists, people with, you know, expertise, with real expertise on uh, infectious diseases and how they spread, have to try to communicate that in very different ways to different publics. And so I think if we look at that as a kind of structural part of history, we see some real continuities. You know, continuities about mistrust of science, and trust of science, mm -hmm. continuities about how, you know, everyday people even are aware of what that science is. And, you know, Monica brought that up earlier. So I think it's, it's this myriad cocktail of, you know, um, you know, science and society. You think that that hearing yesterday, I'm sure many people did see it or caught it this morning. You think Rand Paul was, was the strategy there was to say that uh, Fauci is too much in front of the camera? That, that, and that somehow that disqualifies him slightly as a scientist? Is that how you read that? You know, yeah, in a way, you know, I sort of, you know, read that as Paul sort of at least trying to sow the seed that there are other experts out there. Right. And, you know, I, I kind of look at this in, in, in an article I wrote a few years ago, looking at, you know, uh, uh, when milk was, this is a random example, but I think it's a perfect analogy. Um, in the late 19th century, when milk was first uh, seen and argued that it could spread disease, typhoid, tuberculosis, scarlet mm -hmm. fever, diphtheria, um, the, the, the politicians who were trying to make arguments about how to stop the, the spread and the sale of adulterated milk, um, they turned to scientists, but both sides in some of the legal cases turned to scientists who would support their own view. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that Rand was opening the door to maybe a handful of other scientists who would, who would, you know, create scientific evidence and expertise 
that would fit his whatever his goal is. Right, the American Petroleum Institute equivalent of the climate mm -hmm. climate science. I I want to stay with this just to, just for a second because you've got me thinking about something here, and and again. Monica's provocation that this is the first time um, that we have the science at the same time that the epidemic is unfolding. And yet, you're talking about 19th century epidemiology and public health offices in big cities around the world. They didn't have the science right, but they, had, they already had the sort of bureaucratic spot in municipal government. And they had many of the sort of trappings of knowledge production that would look very continuous to where we are, where we are today. So if that continuity is pretty good from the 19th into the 20th century, where does it break down, Monica? I mean, at what point, it, as we go back in time, do we not have, I mean, I guess a different way to ask you this question is, who's the, who's the Fauci of the 14th century? Oh, I, I wouldn't say there is one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, frankly, in terms of, of being the voice of, uh, of science, there's, um, uh, there's a second wave of plague in the 1360s where the Pope's physician, uh, Gita Sholyak, mm -hmm. um, he himself gets sick uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with plague and he recounts his own symptoms. He recounts the therapy that he used um, to recover. But even that, he bury, buries that discussion in a big treatise on, on surgery um, that he writes. If he publicized that story, if he publicized his expertise, we don't have any evidence um, mm -hmm. uh, for it uh, right now. But I would go back to, 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 to something that I perceive in what's different about the stories that um, uh, we were just hearing about the, 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 the milk and um, so forth. That captures this incredible moment. Jacob's works captures this incredible moment of the rise of germ theory. I mean, this is just kind of, you know, this is when trumpets blares and, you know, mm -hmm. and banners wave in the history mm -hmm. of medicine is the um, beginning of the, the period of, of, of germ theory and it's laboratory medicine. And it's laboratory medicine that is focused on tackling diseases that are already well known and present in um, society. So um, Pasteur um, actually makes his, his, his name primarily in treating um, uh, things that are, are souring wine and, and uh, problems with beer. Um, he's saving the French wine industry. Um, and then he goes into some animal diseases. Um, uh, Koch, um, working in, in Berlin, is working on tuberculosis um, and, and so forth. So, um, uh, 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 and even Hansen, who, who, who claims to have first identified a microbe under um, uh, uh, the microscope with, with, with leprosy, he's working with this very, very um, uh, uh, well-known disease. The difference is, and this is the, the, the trauma that the world experiences uh, in, a, in a smaller way with Ebola and then in a major way with HIV. Um, so then this is the, the 1970s and the 1980s. These are new diseases. Um, this is um, actually a field of public health, global health, it's called emerging infectious diseases. Mm. So that's the big difference. Mm. And that's what's, what's, what puts us in a similar situation now uh, with COVID-19 is, um, yes, we already knew about coronaviruses. Um, yes, they were, very, uh, uh, they were able to very quickly um, uh, sequence um, this genome. But in terms of all these other mechanisms of spread, um, uh, you know, in, the infectious rate, the, the R0 and, and so forth. Everybody's trying to figure it out. Mm. And that's what the catastrophe is. There's more people that have tuberculosis in the world right now um, than have COVID-19. There's more people dying of tuberculosis every day than are dying of, of COVID-19. But that's not a crisis. It should be a crisis, but it's not a crisis because it's something that we know. Right. It's something that can be contained and controlled um, and, and frankly, put to the side wow. um, if, if need be. And there's an industry of science, scientific research, drug, drug manufacturing and so forth, that's already addressing it. Coronavirus is a crisis. The 1918 flu was a crisis. Tuberculosis in the late 19th century, yes, those, it, 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 it was perceived as a crisis in terms of really astronomical levels of um, tuberculosis 
um, uh, prevalence in urban communities, um, for example, in Europe, in the United States. Um, but th there's a, I'm just trying to say there's a different dynamic mm -hmm. of when you're dealing with a, a completely new disease where you have no protocols, you have no drugs, you have no, um, uh, uh, no infrastructure mm -hmm. um, there. Yeah. The amazing thing about the, 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 the germ theory is that mostly it's focused on, we have these new techniques now to study and potentially to control these diseases that in fact we've known about for a very long time. I see. Um, Jacob, did you, was there anything in there you wanted to, to react to or that you wanted to circle back on your previous, previous point? No, I think that's great. You know, I think that's definitely, you know, hits the, hits the nail here about, you know, this being, this being novel. And, and you know, that, that speaks to something really fascinating that does relate to Ebola, it relates to HIV AIDS. Um, it harkens back to, you know, the spread of cholera in the, in the early 19th century of, of the newness of the, the, the novelty of a mm. disease. And you see that even in the naming conventions, that's one of the things that I've been so fascinated with, with COVID-19 um, <clears throat> in the last few months is just, you know, the, the reality that those of us who, who, who are aware of it is that there is this long, longer standing understand, longer standing knowledge of of the of the of the family of coronaviruses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and knowledge of its novelty and the in the sequencing that Monica talked about, and yet its newness in the in the popular discourse uh, has made it into something different, right? It's made it into you know confusion between you know I hear this all the time. I hear you know people even in you know in my circles and in in, in popular media confuse coronavirus for COVID-19, right? Um, they, you know, we see our president, you know, hearkening it to xenophobic comments about, you know, a, 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 a disease of China, a Chinese right. disease, a Wuhan fever was right. one of the early comments that we heard. Um, and those names, I mean, historians that study uh, epidemics, especially new uh, pandemics, uh, we know there's power in that naming. Um, from a social and from a cultural perspective, you know, mm. especially the way in which, you know, uh, if we look at, at, you know, some of those examples, you know, we think about cholera and it was called Asiatic or Indian cholera. And that became a, an important kind of moniker in the, uh, in the 19th century for blaming the disease right. on other people, right? And that's this sort of, you know, common sort of trope about how communities, populations understand disease, mm. particularly new diseases. I want to remind people you're listening to COVID Calls and my guests today, Jacob Steer-Williams and Monica Green. Monica, I want to um, come to you and I want to actually just read a, a little bit, if you'll bear with me, a few lines from your 2018 essay, Putting Africa on the Black Death Map. And then I'm going to shift our conversation over here for a few minutes to some of the work you're doing. Um, so from this article, you say the 2011 study, a 2011 study sequencing why pestis from 14th century London was widely hailed as being confirmatory. Yes, why pestis could be retrieved from victims of the Black Death, implicating it, and not some other microorganism in the largest mortality event in human history. This was no small achievement, of course, given the previous decades of doubt and contention about the cause of the Black Death and other major historical epidemics. Obscured in such an assessment, however, you write, was the fact that the 2011 study also signaled the foundation of a new, hitherto unrealized line of research, the complete sequencing of two different strains of Y. pestis from 14th century London opened up the possibility of beginning to research not simply the history of plague, but the history of strains of plague, that is, to track the organism's development over space and time and to link evolutionary changes to different outbreaks. And this is, so that's from your 2018 piece. Um, you've described it as the new genetics paradigm or a new plague paradigm. This is fascinating work. Can you talk to us about it? Um, in, in 10 minutes, no. <laughs> in three hours, yes, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, the simplest way to, to um, explain it is this, is uh, what, geneticists can do when they have a complete genome of any substance, whether it's humans or a banana, um, is if you have one genome and then you have another one, um, you can compare them and say, okay, what are the differences? Um, and say, okay, um, anything that's more similar to um, banana A 
um, we're going to put in this subfamily and the ones, the thing that has, has elements that are more similar to banana B, we'll put in another um, subfamily. When you get more samples, you can get a higher level of resolution with that subdivisions. So what you're doing is you're creating a family tree. You're saying, okay, probably all these bananas came from an original herb banana, um, but then over time they develop certain um, distinctive uh, characteristics. Well, you can do that with any organism. And again, the more complete genomes you have, the more times you can do that, the greater resolution that you have. So what's the, the amazing thing about the 2011 um, study? It appeared in Nature and got huge press um, uh, all around the world. Was um, they didn't really talk about the fact that they had found two genomes. And what happened was this, is um, they're working with a known cemetery um, in London. This is the, um, uh, the East Smithfield Black Death Cemetery. It was excavated in the 1980s, mm. 1986, 87. Um, the bones have all been taken out. The, the area is built over again. There's nothing to see um, uh, there now. It's where actually the Royal Mint used to be in London. Um, and so anyway, they have the bones that are stored in the um, Museum of, of London. So they, they were just working with the bones. And what happened was, well, it was a clerical error. Um, they found two genomes and they said, okay, three of the bodies, uh, four, from four bodies, they were able to, to get um, essentially full genomic material. Three of the bodies had an identical genome. The fourth body had a different one. And so when they published this, they said, oh, well, look, during the outbreak, because the outbreak lasts, I don't know, like 12, 14 months in, in London, during the course of the outbreak, the genome actually evolved. And this was completely reasonable. I mean, this is what, you know, organisms do is they evolve. That's, what, that's how we're tracking the coronavirus um, now is comparing the differences between all of these genomes. Um, that we have. So nobody thought anything um, about it. I didn't think anything about it. I thought, okay, this is just um, a wonderful, amazing, phenomenally technical work. Five years later in 2016, the same group brings out some new sequences from another gravesite. And this is another well-dated um, gravesite. And this is from the uh, uh, plague of Marseille. Um, outbreak that happens in the 18th century. And it's generally considered the last major plague outbreak on, in continental uh, Western Europe. So between 1720 and 1722. So they bring out um, five complete um, genome sequences um, from that and publish it. And I look at it and I say, hmm, isn't this odd? The Marseille genome, and the argument they're making is that plague seems to have stayed in Europe and evolved within Europe. Mm. So of the, the two genome sequences that came from London, immediately as historians, we would say, oh, well, it's probably um, uh, uh, evolved from the later genome. So if the, the, the Y pestis is evolving during the course of the event, it will be the later genome that survives and then goes, goes on to, to have more progeny. But no, it was the earlier um, form of the genome that they found in, in Marseille. So again, epidemiologically, you can say this, yes, this makes sense. Um, but I started asking some questions. And the thing is, um, uh, in 2009 and 2012, I um, ran an NEH summer seminar in London. And uh, one of our field trips in both, in both summers was to go to the Museum of London and look at some of these um, uh, remains mm -hmm. from the, the, the Black Death Cemetery. Um, and anyway, this is, this is uh, as I said, the, the excavation happened in the 1980s. All the excavation reports were published. And so anyway, I knew you know, who was involved in, in, in the work. I knew where the data was and so forth. And, and so anyway, I was scratching my head um, about thinking about why there were two genomes in, in London. And so I went and looked for the published data and I found body number one, I found body number two, and I found body number three. I couldn't find body number four, um, wasn't in the published data. 
And I thought, okay, maybe as a typo, you know, there's just, you know, two numbers that have been inverted or so. So I tried every combination um, that I could and still nothing. So because I knew the, the bioarchaeologist who had extracted the teeth, she had been involved in, in the study. I wrote to her and I said, is your name Sharon DeWitt? And I wrote to her and I said, um, Sharon, where's body number four? I can't find it in the data. And she said, oh, I'm gonna have to get back to you um, on that. And she wrote back to me a couple days ago and she said, body number four isn't from the Black Death Cemetery. It's from a different cemetery. It's from a later cemetery. Mm. Um, and it's a cemetery um, uh, from an outbreak and plague in the 1360s, um, 1360, 61. So completely different mm. um, manifestation of plague. Now the big, huge question, and I can't solve it. And, and at, at this point, the geneticists can't solve it either is still the question is, did that second genome um, did that evolve within Europe itself or did it evolve somewhere else and then was imported into, um, into Europe? Um, but anyway, the point is, is that question then brought me back to a question I had already had in 2014 is, why is the living strain of plague that's most closely related to the Black Death strain? So the, our, all our Black Death stories are about the Mediterranean, about Europe, mm -hmm. Why is the closest living strain to the Black Death in Africa? Not simply in North Africa, where you might think, okay, well, this, this is part of our regular Black Death never. No, it's in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's in East Africa. It's around the, the Great Lakes um, in, in East Africa, in Uganda, in Democratic Republic of, of, of Congo um, and so forth. So that had been a continuing really big bother, bothersome, um, because um, I had been working with the genetics, genetics um, arguments and, and the way that they use their data long enough to believe that, in fact, okay, this, this is really um, the correct interpretation of it. And it really is very, very close to the Black Death, but how did they get to Africa? And nothing in my world could explain that. And that always bothers me as a historian, is having something, uh, a conundrum that big, that huge, um, have no obvious um, mechanism of, of explanation. So that's essentially, that, that was the genesis of doing that 2018 hmm. um, study. And the prompting was it was because um, the, the editor of the collection, uh, Gerard Schumann, who'll be sp uh, speaking in, in our, our session on Friday, he, working on West Africa, also had questions about maybe the plague reached West Africa too, so Sub-Saharan um, West Africa. Um, and he's an archeologist as well as a historian he's working with different kinds of data. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have any genetic um, indication yet um, that um, plague did in fact reach uh, West Africa, but we had the same problem. And then uh, another person who contributed to the collection uh, was somebody working on Ethiopia and she's working with, um, literary texts, documentary um, texts. And she was finding, yes, in Ethiopia, we have evidence for plague in the 13th century, in the 14th century, in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why nobody ever knew this before is nobody asked, nobody looked. And the only reason I looked, I mean, and I'm a Europeanist, I'm not trained to do um, African history, but I, I be, you know, because uh, Gerard was willing to goad me on, um, I was willing to take a leap and just say, let's follow the genetics. Mm. I mean, so exactly the point that, 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 that you began with is this is what the genetics can do. It's not simply saying, yes, these bodies in the London cemetery um, uh, have uh, died of, of plague, plague in the way we, we understand it and define it now. But these bodies in, in this London cemetery are somehow related mm -hmm. to the, there are, there have been thousands of deaths due to plague in the 20th century mm. in Africa. It is, it is, it, it's to some extent um, controlled in Democratic Republic of Congo, in Madagascar, it's still a very big problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the potential for um, future outbreaks is, is, is still there. Um, I have plague in Arizona. We have plague here in Arizona. 
Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's potential for, for outbreaks up around the Grand Canyon um, and so forth. So plague is something that is controlled for the most part in the world, but it's something that we live with. And, and this is just one of the things I tell my students all the time. Smallpox is the only disease that has been eradicated. Yeah. The only human disease. Yeah. We can add render pest <laughs> if we want to in, in terms of, of, a, of a livestock disease. Um, but that's, that's what we're living with still, is we're still living with these pests. You said you couldn't do it in 10 minutes, but actually you did it in seven. <laughs> uh, and it was such a, I mean, what an incredible um, and important story there in so many different ways. I mean, I think of a couple of the different implications that I take immediately. I mean, one it, where you were just leaving us is um, the, the persistence of a disease that we again want to put in a certain place in a certain time and close that chapter in that book. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. the genetics, that, that when we merge the genetics and the history, it allows us to, it forces us to move away from that position, which mm -hmm. brings up all sorts of troubling historiographical questions about power and about the archive and what gets into the record and what doesn't get into the record. But I'm also thinking mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And Jacob, I want to bring you on this as well. Um, what will be in the coronavirus? What will be in the COVID-19 archive you know these kinds of methods you're talking about here i mean i'm very worried uh, just in the united states um, context of under testing under reporting um you know the fact that we may have the science to know what's amongst us and who it's affecting but that we're effectively not not managing that well in the united states is deeply troubling and it makes me wonder if it then what are the implications more globally for that i mean particularly based on the story you're telling us Monica, um, I think we have to think a lot about you know, what kind of lessons we can draw from that so that similar kinds of mistakes are not made in the present and going forward. That COVID-19 is somehow written out of, preemptively written out of the record. If the plague was written out of the East African record, that matters. If COVID-19 is preemptively written out of, of the record right now, that matters, that matters as well. I'm, I'm in the editorial box on now, I feel like, but I, so I'll come back to maybe some more hard facts, but I don't know. I mean, does that resonate with either, either well, one well, of them? My, my quick statements really would be two points. Number one is there, there's no nations anymore. This is a global phenomenon. It's a global problem. It's a global issue. None of us can just take care of ourselves. Um, because ourselves, remember when I was saying how we use the word we is really significant now. This is all of us, this is humankind as a species, um, full stop, and we need to deal with it. And the other thing I wanna say, and I, this is an, a, an argument that I have um, coming out in, in, in a new piece, I don't know, next week or something, um, where what I say, so I've used before this, this concept of emerging um, diseases, every, infectious disease in the world was once an emerging disease. That's the amazing thing that we're able to do now is actually go back to origins, to talk about origins, at least to speculate about origins. And the point that I made in, in this piece is that we are still living with the aftershocks of previous pandemics. Mm -hmm. That's what tuberculosis is in the world today. It was a pandemic that wasn't controlled, that there was no means of, of controlling it. But then what are the ways in which that those after effects, those aftershocks have been ignored? Um, and that's, I think, the, the huge thing that we have the potential to learn right now is mm. how are we going to control coronavirus and how are we going to control all these other ones? Right. Don't separate them. Don't put them in separate boxes. So just to bring that, Jacob, I want to get your reaction on that, but particularly given that you're a scholar of the British Empire, there must be great resonance here for you in, in the kind of techniques that Monica is describing, how this may change the way we think about what colonial medicine was, or even how mm -hmm. empires are, are built. Can you, sure. that's such a massive question, but could you Yeah, no, I think, you know, I mean, the, the point that resonates, you know, for me right now is, you know, historians, particularly historians who study, um, former processes of colonialism and imperialism are very uniquely 
aware and astute um, about the silences of the archive and whose voices have been preserved and whose voices have been essentially eliminated um, and not made their way into archives. Um, and so I think, you know, you're absolutely right about, you know, at this moment, particularly if we think about it, both at a local level in the US, and you know, we've seen the way in which COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting certain uh, uh, subpopulations in America, um, but, it, but particularly around the globe, you know, whose stories are gonna be written down, whose stories are gonna be remembered. You know, one of the things that I did in my classes um, in March when we moved to online teaching was, I basically like scrapped the rest of my syllabus in terms of the assignments, I still kept the, um, the readings and the lectures, um, but I just told my students to start a primary source, start a journal. You're, uh -huh. you're a person now who's living in an epidemic, in the middle yeah. of a pandemic, and your voice matters. It mm -hmm. ma you know, we've been reading people's voices from the past, but right now your voice matters, and somebody mm -hmm. someday might care about your voice. Um, so I've collected um, a, almost 150 students and their voices for the last wow. few months. Um, and I've started a project with our local um, archives, the Waring Historical Library and Archives, and we're documenting them. Um, and we're trying to reach out to people all throughout Charleston to record their stories of COVID-19, to try to try to keep a documentary record, particularly uh, knowing and, and aware, you know, and here's where historians and archivists and librarians, they're, they're the experts at thinking through this. Of, of these questions of, of whose voices really matter here. Because the, the sad reality is, if in 150 and 200 years, all you have to go by to, to analyze the story is are the daily press briefings from President Trump, you're gonna get a really different historical story than the lived experience is of millions of Americans or people around the world. That was my last question. Thank you for that. And this is kind of, we're up on time, but I did want to get that this question in because you mentioned the archive and um, uh, what can we be doing right now as a historical community to, to work in some sort of spirit of mutual aid with archives and archivists. And, and, and this has been on my mind a lot. And on Monday, I, I spoke with um, some folks from York County, Pennsylvania, the local historical society. They're really tremendous work that they're that they're doing there. Um, and you know, they're trying to preserve this this little slice of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a very interesting and diverse state, and the experience of York is very different from the experience of Philadelphia. It's an it's an important part of the archive, and it's been on my mind. How do we how do we make common cause um, in that process? I guess it, we don't have a lot of time, but if each of you might give one example of something that you think is a good practice along those lines. Uh, well, I have to uh, admit, I haven't been as um, involved or even as concerned about archiving um, practices because my gosh, we are in <laughs> overload in terms of social media, in terms of um, a variety of, of, of different things. I, 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 I'm not concerned, at least in the United States about um, uh, archiving all of that. I think um, for other parts of the world, there, there, there might be some issues. What I think is a tremendous power that we have right now, and I see a lot of people using that wisely and, and innovatively, is um, really just uh, what, what, what um, uh, Jacob has already said, is getting students to realize you are in you are in history. You are living in a historical moment. Things that are changing every single day are part of the transformation of the world that you will be telling your children about. You will be telling your grandchildren about that. Right. That you may be part of the the, the 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 professional core that has documented it in the future. But for them to understand themselves as part of these changes. Um, I think is, is just a tremendous power that we have to, to get them to, the students to realize that and then get them to act on it, to get them to pay attention to what's going on. I, was, I had the tremendous privilege of being involved in, um, in a K through 12 um, training program a, a couple of weeks ago that was also getting, uh, asking students to, to do um, kind of self archival work, but it asked them to do it at all of these different levels of working from their own ways in which, you know, you know, is, you know, did they have a toilet paper crisis in their household? Mm -hmm. um, or, but then asking what's going on 
at local levels, what's going on at the state level, what's going on at the national level, what do you see and how do you see those connecting to what's going on globally? To actually, actually get them do that analysis day by day by day um, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And that is historical thinking. Jacob, thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I totally, totally agree. I think, you know, as, as educators, you know, our students are the most important kind of vessels for this, for inculcating this type of thinking and, 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 and thinking through uh, moments like this. So the more that we can, you know, try to instill in our students um, the, the importance of the archive, the importance of thinking through this moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as somebody who teaches, um, you know, most of my classes are in the history of, of epidemics and pandemics, the history of disease. And, you know, you know, my students, you know, very acutely sense, you know, we can, we can understand 19th century people and how they thought through how they responded to cholera, right? Um, and, and I think the same thing will be true of, of, of right now um, and, and of this, you know, generation of people of how we respond, how we think through um, this pandemic. Um, even as Monica says, there are other health crises all around the world happening. I mean, the disease that I just wrote a book on typhoid is still a, a major killer of, of, of children all around the world um, in the global south. You know, not Western Europe and North America. It's a forgotten disease, a hidden disease. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that you know, I think, you know, as a historian of disease, is so clear to me about the next, what will happen next, is I think you know, COVID nineteen will become invisible at some point. Um, mm -hmm. But it may not become invisible for everyone. It may become invisible for you know, middle class white people in America. But that might not be true of our country, and it certainly might not be true of around the world. So. You know, I think these historical processes can help us to think through not just a crisis moment, but how then we move through a crisis moment, which are, you know, become unevenly experienced by people around the world. I want to remind people you've been listening to COVID calls and tomorrow at 5 p.m. on Thursday, I will be talking to Caitlin Bain and Jacob Dick and John Beard will be talking about Southeast Texas, Jefferson County, Texas and Port Arthur. Talk about a place where history is never too far behind you and the way that they're dealing with COVID-19 has a lot to do with um, health disparities and inheritances of the, pet of the petrochemical industry there. Uh, please do join me for that discussion. And I want to really thank Monica H. Green and Jacob Steer Williams for just a totally mind expanding hour. I, I went to a program in graduate school that was the history of science, medicine, and technology. And I really wish I had focused more on the history of medicine part. Now you guys have really been a, just um, so enlightening. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Uh, it's been Thanks, a pleasure. Monica. Stay healthy, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow at five o'clock on COVID calls.